like a lot of people like the priority. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Like, please talk about the lighting. And Tommy was like, fine, let's do it. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us for a celebration of literature and living writers. My name is Megan Marshall, director of the Hips Island series. And tonight we have a fabulous poets, translator, scholar, and more, who is sure to dazzle and delight, and hopefully make us forget that we still have one more week of instruction before school. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Uh, but before I introduce him officially, I wanna thank those who have helped to make this series and this event possible, and that includes all of our friends from Love Library, Morocco Tunlin, my fabulous co-host. I also wanna thank Donna Nuka Hall, Laura Wiss, and Rebecca Williamson. I also need to thank the uh, Department of English and Comparative Literature, as well as Instructionally Related Activities Fund for their support of the series and this event. And then of course, our friends from Aztec Shops, including Michael Ramirez, and some folks who are selling books over there in the corner, as well as our friends from Poetry International, who are selling books over there in the back. Hint, hint, if you wanna check those out before you leave this evening. Um, and lastly, it's paramount to share or to acknowledge the space that we are uh, privileged to share this evening. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations. And as members of the SDSU community, we acknowledge and celebrate this legacy. Just a few final reminders. If you have yet to do so, please silence your cell phones. Um, and also know that the event is being recorded, but don't worry, all you see is this part of the, the room here. So again, no, no YouTube stars will be made tonight. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's everybody. <laughs> Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured reader. Poet, editor, translator, and scholar Wayne Miller has published five poetry collections, including most recently, Read the Jury, which is currently shortlisted for the Colorado Book Award, Post, which won the Colorado Book Award and the Roka Prize, <laughs> The City, Our City, which was shortlisted for the Roka Prize and the William Carlos Williams Award. His poems have appeared in American Poetry Review, the Kenyan Review, New England Review, the Paris Review, Plowshares, the Southern Review, and elsewhere. He has received fellowships and awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Poetry Foundation, the Poetry Society of America, and Poetry. He has co-translated and co-edited several additional titles, and we are honored to feature in Poetry International's soon-to-be-released issue 29, um, Wayne's translations with Loredana Mahani and the Poet of Cactuses and Orchids and the Manuscript from Moikam Zicha. Wayne teaches at the University of Colorado, Denver, who curates the Unsung Masters series, and in his spare time, edits the esteemed literary journal, Copper Nickel. In a craft talk with my literary editing and publishing students yesterday, uh, Wayne spoke briefly, and I'm gonna paraphrase, about the act of reading as leaning in or leaning back. You lean in when you just need to get it done. Cram that last chapter before the big exam, I know we've all been there. Uh, which can be useful, but it feels like more of a chore. You lean out or back when you're reading for pleasure, when you're truly engaged with the subject matter and you wanna take time to let it marinate. Wayne's own poems invite readers to lean out, to lean back. The way he works, as great poets do, to elevate the mundane, a lone bird hopping amongst feet in an airport becomes a little feathered heart Little Dickinson, maybe. Or a backyard at night. This dark bit of land is a ticking engine. The way he creates astute bridges, as great metaphors do, between the known and the unknown. Middle age articulated as that moment when we've just taken off and the distance between us and the earth is still understandable. That is when I most acutely feel the plane could crash. His artful juxtaposition between abstraction and observation asks us to lean back, to pay attention to our past and current moments, but also overall to revel 
in the process of exploration. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Wayne Miller. Thank you so much, Megan. So nice. Um, and I also want to say, well, first of all, thank you to Megan also just for her hospitality while I've been here. Also, thank you to Sandra and to Blas. Um, I, I feel like you guys had something to do with me coming in. Um, and, um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I am, first of all, look at my watch so I don't read for three hours. <laughs> only an hour and a half. <laughs> and um, so uh, I'm going to read um, kind of in equal parts. I'm going to read maybe for the first 10 minutes or so from We the Jury. And then I have a book coming out next year um, called The End of Childhood. I'm going to read a couple poems from that. Uh, and then I'm going to end with a couple translations. Uh, I've been working on a book of prose um, by Moikam Secho and um, uh, that I've kind of fallen in love with. And unlike with your own poems, you get to talk about how great the stuff you're translating is. <laughs> so um, I just really love this work and I'm gonna um, talk about that and, and read uh, one or two of those. Um, so that's my plan. Um, uh, in these classes that I visited, we've been talking a little bit about generations and um, the different um, the ways in which generations interact with each other. Um, and so uh, I'm going to open with this poem, Generational. Open the bays and we fall together, as in archival footage from last generation's war. We shift inside our tumbling, the air hitting us each a little differently. There's comfort in this collectivity. We'll land together more or less, our impacts giving off globes of light, becoming one light, soundless to the pilots, the bombardiers, wherever they've gone. This is a poem about a dog. <laughs> a parable of childhood. It's a prose poem, so I read it a little bit. The parable of childhood. When the dog finally died, dad dug a hole beside the fence and buried her in a boot box. She's gone, but she had a good life, mom said. It's okay to be sad. Next day, the boy came into the kitchen holding the box in front of him. She's not gone. She's still in there, he said. Look. Mom lifted the lid. Sweetie, when things die, we give them back to the earth. And then we forget them there? Yes and no, Dad replied. He put the box in the hole and covered it over. Together, they walked back to the house. In the morning, the box was on the kitchen counter. I couldn't sleep, the boy said. She was all alone out there. Maybe that's how she wants it to be, Dad replied. No, she doesn't want anything, the boy said. She's dead, but her box was full of air inside the earth. That wasn't right. They filled the box with dirt and placed it inside the hole. What does it mean to die, the boy asked. Dad thought of his own father, who died a year before the boy was born, a long suffering until at last his body had filled with snow. No one knows what death is, Dad said. I wish I had a better answer for you. Four days passed before the box, heavy with dirt and rot, arrived again inside the house. Why is this here? Dad asked. No one knows what death is, the boy said. I wanted to find out. Jesus, Dad said, and went out to the garage. Mom said gently, no, when things die, they're gone, so we return them to the earth. The dog was gone, that was clear, but the dog was also right there, just below the surface, packed in darkness. The boy could bring her back inside whenever he wanted, no matter what his parents said. Uh, one of the first times I read that, someone came up to me uh, afterward and said, um, are, are you the little boy in that song? <laughs> I said, no, I'm the father. <laughs> 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 hmm. 
So I, I taught for a little while, for a long while, for 12 years at a, um, a school in Missouri. And at a certain point, I was invited to this um, dinner at the president's house with the board of directors of the university. And um, I didn't like them very much. So I wrote this poem. <laughs> Meeting the board. It was a beautiful antebellum house. The servers were black students of the university. The silver was out and gibbous. All of this is true. One board member advised me in passing that a teenage daughter shouldn't work. She'd learn from her coworkers criminal things. Instead, she should play soccer. The chairman told us his dream to gather the faculty in the conference center for a day of unified prayer. Our conversation turned briefly to the poor trapped inside the hurricane, which flashed its lightning into different cities at different times. Those people are never prepared, explained a board member's quaffed wife. The occasion was to mark a recent departmental success that no one expected the board to find interesting. The room was a capsule of their power they were obliged to inhabit before departing for their sealed and, I assume, magnificent box seats above the stadium. For that hour, their approval engulfed us like kudzu. They admired our work, they said, and understanding the balance required of their position, not to mention the impotence of literature. If they read it, they would probably admire this poem. <laughs> That's my uh, my very weak revenge. <laughs> After the miscarriage, we sat in the car, snow coming down, just to get out of the house. I lowered the window sometimes to stop the snow from sealing us in. <clears throat> the lights were still on in those rooms where our daughter, barely three, kept moving, shifting her things. How many days, weeks, did we leave her in that lit up silence? Back inside, we let our footprints melt on the floor. She ran and hugged us each entirely, as though we'd come home after curfew to this devoted, oblivious parent. Um, when the pulse shooting happened, I, I read a, um, a newspaper account of um, of the first responders who went into that horrific space. And one of the things that they talked about repeatedly was all of the cell phones that were ringing in the pockets of all the people who had been killed. Um, and that um, struck me uh, as it probably struck a lot of people as um, uh, jarring and profound. Um, and one of my really good friends uh, grew up in Orlando um, as a gay man who grew up in Orlando and came out there. And so I wrote this poem for him. Um, I think of this as a kind of, um, I don't know, an allyship poem, something like that. It's called Carillon. Phones were ringing in the pockets of the living and the dead, the living stepped carefully among. The whole still room was lit with sound like a switchboard and those who could answer said, hello. Then it was just the dead, the living trapped inside their clothes, ringing and ringing them. And this was the best image we had of what made us a nation. All right, this is a, a longer poem. Um, I know that's terrifying to hear, <laughs> not that long. Um, it's just a couple pages. Um, but uh, this is set in Houston, Texas, where Blas and I went to grad school together at the same time. Um, and, uh, and this happened on, so this is a true story. This happened on um, September 10th, 2001. 
Um, so you know what happened on September 11th, um, I hope. And um, uh, But it also is about, my father lived in Houston when I was growing up, and it's also um, about his really good friend who, uh, he was his best friend while he lived in Houston. And this guy um, I knew had spent time in prison and I was told that that was for, um, uh, for a robbery. And when he got out, he then um, became an educator and he, uh, he did a bunch of other things. I had this moment where I realized I had access when I arrived in Colorado to this database of, um, of uh, um, a database of like local newspapers um, that was like a, a database that the library had. And I thought I should look him up and find out what he actually went to jail for. Uh, you know, I thought I would find some circumstances about this. And, um, and what I found was um, sort of harrowing. Um, and so this is about that as well. Um, and so uh, here we go. On history, um, you want to count it down. It is in eight sections. One. <laughs> In December 1961, George Trabian shot Winifred Jean Whitaker and left her body beside the Trinity River in one of the long twin shadows of the I-10 overpass. In August 1988, George Trabian took me out on Trinity Bay in his 25-foot sloop and taught me how to sail. Past the bridge, he cut the engine, and I felt us lock suddenly into the wind, dragging overhead, invisible, unrelenting machine. Two. Trabian was in a, quote, narcotics-fueled frenzy when he murdered Whitaker while searching for more drugs on, quote, the Negro side of town, when he attempted to assault a 14-year-old girl then returned her home, when he burglarized a house in wealthy River Oaks for $7. In the subsequent trial, which lasted three months, the prosecutor sought the death penalty but did not succeed. Three. The Trinity River enters Trinity Bay by way of the Anahuac Channel, which was cut through the Marsh Park Delta by the Army Corps of Engineers, and on the map looks like a straw thrust into the bay's broad bladder. Those afternoons, George took me sailing. I don't believe we ever went over to that other side of the bay. Four. He drank cans of beer from a plastic cooler. I drank seven of them. He taught me to tie knots and watch the mainsail for luffing. Those afternoons were a favor to my father, who still had to work while I was visiting from Ohio. George, who'd become a professor after 15 years in prison, had his summers off. Five. Trabian was finally arrested in the lobby of the Auditorium Hotel, which I'm shocked to discover became the Lancaster, and where on September 10th, 2001, I had drinks after seeing Solomon Rushdie read. The event was picketed by fundamentalists, police barricades maintained the channel through the crowd. I don't remember what Rushdie read or anything he said. I remember passing through that compacted organ of anger and into the vast theater, red and plush and radiant with money. The protesters remained outside and Rushdie was the only person facing their direction as he spoke. And of course, it was September 10th, 2001. Six. The family of Winifred Jean Whitaker must despise George Trabian, who is surely both abstract and the very most powerful expression of real. They would be right to say it was a racist travesty of justice. He became a professor and remained for the rest of his life in Houston, their town, walking free with his title and the prestige it carried. They must find it horrific he could spend 20 years running a master's program for prisoners, that he had the means and time to own a boat and teach a boy to sail. Seven, my God, why did my father let George Trabing take me out alone on his boat? To show friendship, to offer trust. As a teenager, my father had wanted to be a priest, though by 1988, he'd long become an unshakable atheist. I know George was his good friend, and no doubt dad thought I would enjoy sailing. Beyond that, it was a religious decision, an atavism, a proof of faith, I'm pretty sure. Eight, dare I say, 
of the men I spent time with as a child. George was among the very kindest and most generous, and he offered me a respectfulness I didn't at 12 deserve. I sometimes flip through the Royce's sailing illustrated he gave me, and I recall his insistence that a sloop rolled by the wind would quickly right itself. Surely he said that only to allay my fear when the boat heeled hard and I yelped, thinking we were going over. He is to me both an abstraction and a very powerful expression of real which is why I'm still here in the library so late in the afternoon, retrieving articles from 1962 on George Trabin. Okay, I'm gonna to switch to uh, some newer poems. Um, well, we're already talking about my dad and his friends, so I'll read this one. It's called On Aesthetics. This is a one sentence poem. Um, that's its form, it's just one sentence. It is, it doesn't need explanation. <laughs> On Aesthetics. Here, the boy is 15. When his father's friend Paul, six foot six and seething because his music career ended 25 years ago and ever since he's taught middle school, calls the boy a little prick, a little piece of shit because Paul has tried to play a Stan Getz album for the boy and the boy has looked bored after saying something vague about the prog bands he likes. And so Paul rises, rocking with the ocean of anger inside him and tells the boy that little shit to stand up and face him. And the men have been drinking on the deck for four hours and the boy is terrified. And then the boy's father, a foot smaller than Paul, lurches into the man's bulk and tells him not ever to fucking talk to his son like that, not ever. And Paul says the boy's a little shit, but okay, okay, take it easy, and steps back and sorry. And now his father is pacing around the apartment, caught up in the language still surging inside him when he falls against the table, scudding it across the floor. And Paul and the boy rush over to lift the father and carry him to Paul's bedroom and lay him down slurring unintelligibly. And the boy is frantic because maybe his father is having a stroke, a heart attack. But Paul goes into the kitchen saying not to worry. He's seen this sort of thing before and holds up the half empty fifth the father has chugged to muster the courage to stand up to his friend. And this is where the boy wants out wants to leave, but there's no place to go. He's caught inside this space. Stan gets still playing. Paul's saxophone case open, the boy notices beside the table. And I think this is too much narrative, too much play by play, which is why I've given up every time I've tried to write it these past 15 years since before my father died. But now distance provides a useful objectivity. So when I watch the boy lie down beside his father, finally in Paul's bed, I can see the darkness around them for what it is, shared breath, which is what this poem is made of. Find this other poem somewhere in here. This one's new, so I'm not very good at navigating it yet. Oh, here we go. The end of childhood. My daughter is building a path across the lake. Each morning she, she goes out with an armful of boards and hammers them into the ice. Her brother brings the coffee can of nails, tucks the hammer into his belt. The ice is thick, the path is growing. We watch them all day from the railing. No one else lives at this end of the valley, though up around the bend there are lights. My daughter's project is not to reach them, she tells us, 
but just to leave a perfect track of boards floating on the water that first day the ice has melted. Let me read this um, poem as a bit of a transition into these translations. So, um, so I met this Albanian poet named Moikum Zecio when I was an undergrad. Um, and I started um, very badly translating him in collaboration with him and his daughter, especially his daughter who spoke English and Albanian because I did not speak Albanian. Um, but uh, to make um, poems into actual poems in English, um, you don't just need to know the source language. You also need to do some work of making them operate as poems in English. So that was sort of my job. Um, I worked on that book for about 10 years. It eventually came out. Um, at some point, I hit a point where I can, I can kind of read some Albanian, but I'm certainly not fluent. Um, and uh, meanwhile, Moikam in, uh, in 2019 was dying. He died in 2020 of leukemia. Um, He's a major figure in Albania, um, one of the most important public intellectuals. He published 100 books. He was a member of parliament. He was on the Olympic team. He directed their equivalent of the Smithsonian. It's a small country, um, but, uh, but he did many of the things there. Um, he was just a really extraordinary man. And so I went to visit him in 2019, early before COVID. Um, and it was my first time really spending um, some time in a post-communist country um, at some length. And so this poem is sort of thinking about that. This is called Socialist Realism. It's also thinking about Americanness, I think. Um, and then after this, I'm gonna read a couple of the translations. So that's why this is a transition. Socialist Realism, Tirana, 2019. Tirana is the capital of Albania. In a courtyard behind the museum stood two derelict statues of Stalin, each twice as tall as a man, patinated green, the bases still slick with last night's rain. The space was empty, except for two kids rasping up and down the concrete on skateboards, then landing with that familiar wooden clatter. One statue's arm had been torn off, so I could see into the hollow I imagined was still filled with the air of the 20th century. Inside the museum, the exhibit was on socialist realism because 30 years had passed and those paintings were now powerless artifacts. It was time to consider them through the abstracting lenses of period and style. Back home across the ocean, my children were sleeping, their sound machines projecting up into their rooms like statuous plinths. In Candide, the deposed kings will dine forever in Venice, while all the buoyant, resolute people in those paintings are building a future. They're mortaring walls and climbing telephone poles. They're working the fields in flowery dresses, melting down metal for I-beams and monuments. The future is right there, a transit station waiting for them to lock into it. I can't help but exude my country's aging narratives of triumph. Art is not just agreement or disagreement, you said. It shapes the moment and to form. In the cab to the airport, as we slid beneath the dappled canopy of beaches, the driver blessed me three times simply for being an American who could say in his language that his country is beautiful. Um, and since I know uh, a lot of you are um, uh, young writers and inspiring writers, I'm going to read Moikam's essay that he calls The Great Secret, um, The Great Secret of Writing. So um, this is like his writing advice, um, which is uh, highly scholarly and different, uh, difficult and references ancient Rome a lot because he was an archaeologist and a historian. So. Um, if you want to feel not smart, talk to him like um, So uh, he's going to use some, um, some, uh, some Latin phrases. Um, uh, he's going to say uh, modus moriendi, which is like the, uh, a way of dying. Panta rei, uh, which is, oh God, what does that mean? Um, does anyone know what that means? I wrote it down and then I forgot to bring it up here. Um, 
uh, it's like the, um, oh yeah, it's uh, it's just uh, like as things go, basically. Um, I think that's it. Anyway, okay, the great secret. So this is, uh, oh, and also a uh, script uh, minute, um, uh, which is like writing lasts um, or writing indoors. Um, so this is Moikam the I, and this is Moikam not me. My own excessive delicacy, thankless humility, and various muddled activities over the past many years have led me neither to challenge nor to mythologize anyone. The great secret of writing has never been conclusively identified or defined. Who can fully understand how the bones of a child develop in a woman's soft and gentle womb? Some simply say scripta manent, but I don't entirely buy this old Latin postulate. Just as political myths exist within our social world, artistic myths exist within the world of literature. Those considered the greatest writers at the end of this century might no longer be considered great in the next century. In the vast roulette of a casino, one can throw both dice and the names of writers. Science is capable of new inventions and discoveries. Art can only repeat itself. All the great artistic themes are already present in Homer. Love, jealousy, expectation, trickery, loyalty, adultery, power, the homeland, the Empyrean, myth, <laughs> hatred, even mercy. When King Priam, white-haired and bereft, falls to his knees before Achilles to receive the broken body of his son Hector, we encounter what some have claimed as the model for King Lear. Perhaps we even find here the genesis of Christianity. The hero Hector, perhaps even Achilles himself, is the Discuri twin great-grandfather of merciful, unfortunate Christ. Each century articulates the same basic artistic formulas, though via different forms and idioms. The essence remains both multi-layered and the same. It should be clear that I believe neither in fossilized publicity nor in the hallucinations of electronic media nor do I believe in the mediocrity of cosmic spleen or in the wigs of the concubines of unskilled writers, because I am who I am, as I can't be who people sometimes want me to be. Mortally sealed inside the framework of historical events, I try to observe the world through the lens of thought, because every future era describes the previous era as having been blind, because the illusion of history, which is even more solid and detailed than the word illusion might imply, is that it always seems like the present, but it never is the present. All this thinking is both severe and self-serving, and for its tactlessness, it can sometimes be accused of heresy. The same is true of me. I generally manage to ignore the denunciations, concerns, disdain, and ridicule that have come my way. Zoroastrian philosophy has given me a faint hope, yes, hope, and a more humane and thus a more artistic future. Zoophilia in art is no longer a marvel. Humanism in art is the new Titanism. Veneration of money alienates humanity and therefore alienates the arts. To understand this is to understand the air we breathe every second, the smog that like a death scalp covers over our, our interiors, to feel the anxiety one would feel inside a black hole, to comprehend a man's impotence or a woman's inverted sterility. To understand this is to make language into an armor of survival and protest, an armor to preserve dignity and a meaningful future that can transcend the old repetitions, the perpetuum mobiles, the pointless movements of Sisyphus. To understand this is to understand the difference between dusk and dawn between endings and beginnings, between falsehoods and truth. To grasp a contradiction fully is to avoid returning forever to that contradiction. Since good and genuine readers have become exceedingly rare, elusive, even societally trivialized, I offer here what shy, innocent, and maliciously sly Jorge Luis Borges has written. When the end approaches, there are no longer any remembered images, only words remain. Words, displaced, ugly, foreign, are the miserable alms that all the moments the centuries have left us. Every true book is an outsider, a rare exception. All the others are ultimately too problematic and thus insignificant. One's manner of writing is a modus moriendi, 
One must proceed lightly and disloyally to grow what isn't there but should be, because it all must develop according to the formula of Panta Rei, which means to encounter an Eros mortally wounded by his own arrow, to turn false rosaries into actual pearls, to yoke the biblical behemoth to a plow with the tip of a pen, or in the depths of one of the Laurel Lakes to envision an ancient Japanese calmly drinking tea before performing harakiri, or maybe to turn one's skin into an autumnal parchment wrapped around material bones, while one's eyes return to the surface of memory and the magical vowels of Rimbaud become married to our profaning consonants. Every great book reaches beyond poetry to become more essentially poetry. Every great book is prose and simultaneously not prose. Every great book isn't just original, it's a centaur, a sphinx, a griffin, a creature part Dionysian half animal and part Apollonian half man. Just as Democritus willingly blinded himself so he could think more clearly in darkness, so the eyes of those who love Medusa must be shielded by impenetrably dark glasses, which are, in fact, the glasses of all the great blind visionaries, such as Homer, glasses that Medusa materialized from within her own mind, because this was the only way she could go on without turning us all to stone. Because, as Heraclitus says, a hidden harmony is more powerful than an obvious one. No, you don't still rush. Another <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> 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 uh, we the jury is on set. Do we still have copies left? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Is on sale in the back. If you would like to get a copy, I'm sure Wayne would be happy to sign it for you. Um, also, there's copies of the anniversary issue of Poetry International, which also features Wayne Wayne's work and amongst many many other great poets. So check it out. Uh, we're gonna linger in the room for a little book signing. But if anybody would like to join us, for about ten minutes across the hallway in room 408, Wayne is going to be giving a Q and A session. If not. Thank you all so much for being a wonderful audience and uh, we will see you back in a couple weeks. Thanks again. How was the nerd? It was good. It was really good. It was good to have you. Oh, no, no, no. Doing our poetry class. It was really nice, isn't it?